This is a three-dimensional integral here. And we're dealing with the um, uh, uh, we're doing this at equal times. Yeah, I, I should have specified. So let's, uh, let's integrate over x here. And mm -hmm. so phi is a function of t and three vector x. Uh, so we're doing a spatial integral. Then this phi y uh, is phi of the same time and three vector y. So what we're, what we're getting here is del three of x minus y. And then we do the integral over the delta function and we just end up with d zero phi of y. So the conjugate momentum, should we do like a 30 second recap for the video? Is uh, the time derivative of phi of y. Okay, a uh, recap for the video. <laughs> How far back are we going through the string theory? And no, all, just, uh, <laughs> just to uh, restart. Read your Schwinger fields. <laughs> okay, so what we want to do is quantize the Klein Gordon. And so we start with the, the action, the integral of the Lagrange density, which is a functional now of the field and its phi and its derivatives. Uh, the, the variation of this gives the Klein Gordon equation, box phi is m squared phi uh, squared sine of minus, right? Oh, just, yeah, just, no, just no, phi. Just, just yeah. phi. But just phi. I, yeah, I think, I think we want uh, to, let's see, it should be a minus there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. The way to check the sign in this is to imagine a plane wave solution, so phi <coughs> is a e to the i uh, over h bar e t minus p dot x. Okay, there's there's a plane wave. Uh, our our box starts with d d t squared minus del squared is our d'Alembertian. So look at the time and the energy. This is going to pull down uh, it, basically an i e squared. So uh, the box of this phi. It's going to look like minus e squared. e squared dominates the mass. e squared minus p squared is the mass. So this e squared has to have the same sign as the m squared. So Got it. minus here in order for this to work. Okay, so uh, back to finding. Uh, all right, so how do we quantize this field? We're going to do canonical quantization. So the first thing we do is find the Hamiltonian formulation of the field theory. We find the Poisson brackets, and we let Poisson brackets go to commutators. Uh, we let the fields, phi and its conjugate momentum pi, go to operators. And then, from solutions for those fields, uh, we can... Uh, do some manipulations that allow us to construct a consistent Hilbert space of states on which those operators act. Now, uh, so the first step is finding the uh, conjugate momentum uh, with a particle. That's just the partial of L with respect to the velocity. But uh, now, since L is a functional, we need to take a functional derivative. Uh, we do this all at a given time. So uh, both sides, we're evaluating at the same time. We take a functional derivative with respect to the uh, three vector y. And we just come inside, we're gonna, we're gonna pick out just the one term in here that's a time derivative. And that leaves us with a time derivative times the delta function, which we integrate over to find the conjugate momentum is just the time derivative of the field. Now, let's, um, sorry, could you remind me what the partial zero means? <coughs> Phi dot. Uh, let's see, actually, uh, yeah, let's see, um, yeah, d, d alpha is uh, d dx zero and uh, uh, gradient, right? 
And then the zero and, is just uh, okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So it's just yeah. zero. Yeah. X X zero is really <coughs> CT if you ever need to know where the C's go. <coughs> okay. So now we can we can write the uh, we can write the action in terms of uh, the momentum, but that's that's not quite where we need to get. Uh, what we want is the Hamiltonian. Let's, let's, let's find the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is going to be okay. Now, for a particle, what do we do? We we have uh, velocities and their conjugate momenta. Uh, we sum over those and subtract the Lagrange. For a field theory, we're going to do much the same thing, only the conjugate momentum. Pi is, uh, well, there's just one pi. There's one phi dot <coughs> minus L. But these are parameterized not just by time, but uh, we need to do the, the full integral d3x to uh, over, over these. These are really densities. So, uh, Quick question. Yeah. So George should to be asking, um, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, that is there a way to write the solution to this as a Fourier transform of the potential to this client coordinate equation? The potential by what so so, what? so like so, so like so you have box phi equals minus M squared, yeah, fine. Okay, yeah. add another term there. Yeah, that is okay. Here. You know, we're we're mm -hmm. gonna look at something like that when we talk about antiparticles. So, yeah, we're we're solving this equation. What what you find more frequently than a potential for phi? Yeah, is is that you have some source. Mm -hmm. You have right. some source over here, yeah. and you use a yeah. green function mm -hmm. to to solve that yeah. equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna do that. We're going to find the green functions for this, mm -hmm. and uh, they turn out to be very interesting because they show that you can. Uh, they show how to understand the negative energy solutions. Okay. Which even when you know Dirac was hoping he had solved that problem by going to a first order equation, the negative energy solutions still occur. Mm -hmm. Right? They turn out to be antiparticles. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you show from the green function. That you you actually have a choice of poles in the propagator and uh, the uh, basically the green function mm -hmm. uh, by by choosing the poles in one way you show that you have that it's the that the field is the sum of two terms uh, one of which depends on the past behavior of J one of which depends on the future behavior of J. So the backward time traveling solutions uh, depend only on the the future currents, yeah. and you interpret those as uh, particles traveling backward in time. Yeah. So they're perfectly causal. Uh, in fact, any any choice of the four different green functions, uh, you you have two positive energy green functions, two negative energy green functions, mm -hmm. and any choice of a positive and a negative energy. It gives uh, gives you the same causal structure. In fact, uh, Feynman, Feynman was the one who showed that. And then that's where J is some function of V. Well, if we if we do this in a fundamental way, mm -hmm. uh, what we're going to add to the action over here to do that is, uh, you know, something uh, where phi say times a psi star psi. You've got some coupling between phi and some spinner field, say. And that, I mean, that's just the most trivial thing you can write, right? You could couple anything you want to phi that's built out of some other fields, and that would provide a source like this. We don't actually use, you know, in our example, we don't use that. Just, it's a way to, to write an example action that has a source like this. Getting ahead of the story. Yeah. Let's quantize this field first. Yeah. Okay, so this turns into... Uh, Right, we have the spatial integral d3x uh, pi phi dot 
minus L is has it. Uh, well, we can write it as a half pi phi dot because uh, pi is phi dot, basically. Uh, then we subtract the del squared. Or, sorry, the um, what do we have? The, the gradient term, grad phi dot grad phi, uh, was subtracted. Now becomes positive. And then we have, uh, we're subtracting the m squared, so we end up adding m squared phi squared here. And then these two combined so that uh, and then these are half. So we have a half d3x. So this will be, this is pi phi dot, but phi dot is pi. And we have to write the Hamiltonian in terms of pi. So we get uh, pi squared plus grad phi dot grad phi plus m squared phi squared, a, a tidy quadratic form for the Hamiltonian. Now, uh, we want to find Hamilton's equations. So we do some functional derivatives here. Uh, what we expect is that pi dot and phi dot are given by functional derivatives of the Hamiltonian Let's see, which one should, do we expect to be negative? Uh, phi dot should be variation of h with respect to pi. Pi dot minus variation of h with respect to phi. Now, we carry that out. So let's look at the Hamiltonian and carry out those functional derivatives. The, the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to phi. Okay, so we're going to pick up phi here and here. Uh, let's see, so we'll have a half integral d3x. Then we'll get two terms. We get grad phi 2 times grad phi dot uh, grad del phi of x with respect to del phi y. Let's, let's call this y here. Uh, then the last term will get 2 m squared phi del phi of x del phi of y. Now that's a delta function, del 3x minus y. This is the derivative of a direct delta function. So we're going to integrate by parts. So this, the, the twos cancel. We have minus d3x. Uh, integrating by parts, we have del squared phi uh, minus del squared phi, sorry, plus m squared phi del 3 of x minus y. And we integrate that to get del squared phi minus m squared phi. Uh, those evaluated at y equal times. For the second one, uh, for let's bring this down to get to get phi dot. We want the variation of the Hamiltonian with respect to pi, and that's just the one term. We're going to get a half times d3x times 2 times uh, pi of x times del pi of x del pi of y, and then this is <coughs> del 3 of x minus y. We do the integral, cancel the halves, and we just get uh, pi of x. So uh, this recapitulates the definition of pi. We knew that pi was phi dot. Uh, if we if we take another derivative, all right, no, the the two Hamilton equations then are pi dot is del squared phi minus m squared phi, uh, and pi is equal to phi dot. If I take a second derivative of pi of phi. That's got to be pi dot, but that's equal to del squared 
phi minus m squared phi. I bring this to the other side, and I have the Galen-Pearson equal minus m squared phi, and I have recovered the Klein-Gordon equation. So using the Hamiltonian formulation, we can recover the usual Klein-Gordon field equation for phi. Any questions here? What does the square mean, the Laplace? The, the square. That's the D'Alembertian. Oh. That's yeah, the just it's, it's the space-time Laplacian, right? Yeah, box, box is d squared, d, d squared, c for keeping track, c minus del squared. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we want to write this in terms of Poisson brackets. Right, we're going to do canonical quantization, so we write it in terms of Poisson brackets, and then we uh, replace the brackets by commutators and the fields by operators. So we need to define the Poisson bracket when we're dealing with fields. And the only, the only thing we have to do is to replace the partial derivatives by functional derivatives. And I think you can probably see that they're acting as ordinary derivatives, really, for, uh, for simple cases. So if we have two dynamical variables, which I mean functions of phi and pi, I can define their Poisson bracket. Uh, let's, let's let these be functions of x. <clears throat> pi of x and it can be y and <coughs> pi of y. So remember what we do. We we take the functional derivative with respect to the coordinates. Well, that's going to be some phi of z. Different variable here. We take the functional derivative of the second dynamical variable with respect to pi of z, and now we sum over all z. And then we reverse the order of the, we reverse the derivative so it's f with respect to pi of z and del g with respect to phi of z. Again, the sum over all z. Plus on bracket. Minus. You, you remember what it looks like for ordinary x and p. If we have functions yeah, this, of... This is not the anti-conic case. This is uh, cf, d, yeah. xi, d, g, I use, d, You use the curly brackets for the anti-commutator, too, so I think that's what... The oh, uh, yeah. <coughs> Peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, yes, I see the confusion, of course. Yeah, this is the Poisson bracket. Okay, so uh, in, the, in the case we're interested in, we need the fundamental Poisson brackets here. We, no, we want to reproduce the, <coughs> we want to reproduce Hamilton's equations. So, uh, well, there are several. We want to know how phi and pi uh, bracket with the Hamiltonian, that should give us Hamilton's <coughs> equations. And we want the fundamental commutators between uh, phi x and phi y, between uh, phi x and pi y, and between pi x and pi y. But since these, these are the canonical coordinates, uh, <coughs> These two are trivially zero because, okay, del, del phi x del phi z is going to be a Dirac delta in x minus z. But uh, del phi y del pi z, phi and pi are independent in the Hamiltonian formulation. So that gives zero. Then again here, this gives zero. So the pi derivatives here give zero. The phi derivatives here give zero. The only one we really have to worry about is d3z. And now, only one, one contributes. Uh, the first term here is going to give a del 3 of x minus z. 
And that second functional derivative is going to be a del 3 of uh, y minus z. And we do the integration, and it's going to give us a single delta function, del 3 of x minus y. So just what we would like to see for the fundamental Poisson brackets. And these are the ones we quantize. We're going to turn these to square brackets, put hats on everything, and put an IH bar right here. <laughs> okay, and now we've quantized the field. And then we have a party. <laughs> well, what? This, this is shiny, right? Okay, uh, let's let's check the uh, just let's check Hamilton's equations first, though. And uh, let me oh. see. Why should this scheme be characterized as quantization, though? Ah, well, uh, this this is. You know, all quantization is conjectured, right? Classical mechanics doesn't tell us how to quantize anything. <clears throat> uh, so what what was developed up to leading up to the Schrodinger equation in 1927, and then subsequent words about what that means, is that uh, what happens is that your observables become Hermitian operators. Right. So the difference here is instead of observing the position of a particle, we're observing the value of the field. This takes the place of the coordinate, and this is conjugate momentum. And so we expect x and p to satisfy ih bar Kronecker becomes ih bar Dirac. Okay. So so we're doing just what we would do for particles. This was shown, before anybody started doing field theory, this was shown to correctly quantize uh, uh, particles, you know, to correctly reproduce probably the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics, which is equivalent to Schrodinger. Okay, now, uh, the canonical quantization uh, uh, procedure was developed by Dirac um, in the 30s as a means of uh, answering an outstanding question raised by the Schrodinger equation. Uh, if you write Maxwell's equations, you find that particles are the source for the Maxwell equations. Those currents, well, those currents are flowing electrons, and electrons are quantized, which means that your electromagnetic field has to be quantized, or that equation doesn't make sense. The Maxwell equation now needs to be some sort of operator or, uh, you know, field equation for quantized objects. Mm -hmm. And so people set about quantizing the electromagnetic field, and that's when Dirac, uh, other people worked on well, this very hard too, but uh, Dirac showed this uh, canonical procedure, uh, applied it to the Hamiltonian formulation of electromagnetism, Maxwell theory, and generated consistent results for quantizing the electromagnetic field. <coughs> yeah, then it was really Feynman who came up with a satisfactory perturbation theory for examining the interactions of the quantized electromagnetic field with the quantized <coughs> particle fields. That was 40s. 1940s. Uh, let's let's just check <clears throat> Hamilton's equations again uh, using the Poisson brackets. So we we should have uh, phi dot. Let's see which way do I want to do this. Let's try phi dot of x ought to be uh, phi with the Hamiltonian. Uh, let's see what are my parameters here. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's well, the Hamiltonian depends on phi and pi. And <clears throat> so we, we want this bracket, so <clears throat> we need uh, functional derivative of phi x with respect to phi z, integral d. Z, 
with the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to <coughs> chi uh, z. And then the, the other term is just going to be zero because del phi del pi is zero. So this is going to give a delta function, change uh, this functional derivative to an x, and what we find is that uh, del h del pi, we did that, it's where to go, del h del pi is just pi. <coughs> uh, so we get, a, we get a pi of z, del 3 x minus z, integral gives pi of x. So we, we reproduce pi equals pi dot, then we do pi dot and find that we get this, the same thing we had uh, pi of x with the Hamiltonian. And this is going to be minus because it's this term that survives where we take uh, del pi del pi. Uh, this is just going to turn into del h del phi of x, uh, which is what we have over here. Okay, so we reproduce uh, the Klein-Gordon field equation uh, via Hamilton's equations by writing Poisson brackets. <clears throat> so, we're, uh, so, yeah, now, quantize it, All right? Don't link. So, phi x, phi y equals zero at, at uh, phi x hat with pi y hat is pi h bar del 3 x minus y and pi with pi is zero. Okay, so voila. We've now got commutators. Now the work begins. Do you need those commutators to act on something to show that they're zero? Well, yeah, right. I mean, yes, let, let it act on some yeah, <coughs> some state, oh, right? Oh. We haven't defined our space of states, but it's all implicit <coughs> in having operators, right? Yeah. Our goal here is to define the space of states. Okay. That's where we're headed here. Okay, so what we need to do is we're going to go back to the classical situation. <coughs> we're going to write the Fourier solution to this linear field equation for mm -hmm. phi, uh, express it as... Uh, a Fourier integral, and we're going to solve, still classically, for the mode amplitudes in terms of the fields, phi and pi. <coughs> now we put hats on everything, and we see that the mode amplitudes have to have hats on too. So the mode amplitudes, a hat, a dagger, uh, we can calculate their commutator from the commu these fundamental commutators, and we see that they have exactly the commutation relations of raising and lowering operators just like a simple harmonic oscillator. We know how to define the space of states now. A lowers the state, but the Hamiltonian is, uh, we can write it uh, as um, non-negative. Mm -hmm. And so we see that there's a lowest state that, that defines the vacuum state acting with every possible lowering operator. Then we act with raising operators of various wave vector. Uh, as many as we like, creating particles <coughs> of various number and wave vector. And that is then our Hilbert space of states. Now carrying that out is, well, it'll take us till the custom, right? Yes. Can I go back a little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> when you go from the Poisson bracket mm -hmm. to the commutator, yeah. the only difference is you're, the commu you commute the second term. Right. Commute the second Which term. You said you have delta G, delta F in the second term. Yeah. And in quantum yeah, mechanics... The, yeah, this ended up being the second term. Right, but the only difference is that you you commute that. And in quantum mechanics, it's an operator, so it's not the same thing. 
Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this commutator, yeah, is what happens if you act with this, then act with that, and then subtract them in the opposite right. order. Right. It is a different thing, right? Right, it's, but it's exactly that, except you can you commute the second term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, yeah. This this is an operator relationship. Over, over here, you know, we took functional derivatives and just got right. there are some functions. So, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, now these these no longer are that, but this is the right rule to write down to quantize your theory. It's, yeah. it's an ansatz, right? Yeah. It's, um, you know, there's another uh, largely equivalent way to quantize fields, which is to write the path integral over the action. Write the path integral, the sum of histories okay. over over the exponential of <coughs> I over h bar times the action. Right, that uh, that gives uh, equivalent yeah. results in solvable situations. <coughs> but the either either of them is an ansatz for what the quantum theory is. Ansatz right? is this addition. Next step. A wild ass guess. <laughs> right. But yeah, the, we're going to say this is the way to do it. You. You put these things down, and then this gives consistent results, and so you think you wrote the right thing down. But the real transition yeah. is that they don't commute, that you really go into Oh, yeah, these, don't, these do not commute, right. So going yeah, these, are, these are not functions. So going from functions to operators yeah, that's right. is the key step to get to quantum mechanics, right? Yes. In the way. Yes. That's, that's right. right. From Poisson yeah. to this, it's yeah. that transition. So, yeah, so the measurement theory that is on rules of quantum mechanics uh, it tells us that uh, the order of making measurements matters. Mm -hmm. And so we represent <coughs> dynamical variables by operators that do not commute. Right? That's, that's a fundamental tenet of how we understand and interpret quantum mechanics. Now, the next problem is what commutations do we write down? Canonical quantization is a rule for saying we're going to write down these. Um, because we actually know that Hamilton, Hamiltonian things are actually remarkably close to quantum things. Uh, you can see that most closely with the Hamilton Jacobi equation. The Hamilton Jacobi equation, let's see, do I remember it? Uh, it's something like, um, See what? Yeah. What is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation? You have the Hamilton's principal function, right? Like this. Uh, uh, let's see. What is it? Plus v s. Uh, something like this is um, d s t t. Something like this is the Hamilton equation. Is that where s is the action? <coughs> No, uh, S is Hamilton's <coughs> principal function. It's the action evaluated on the classical path, is what oh. it turns out to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, um, you know, bas basically this is the Hamiltonian evaluated at uh, p equal to grad S and, uh, and, and x and t. And all you really have to do is let p be grad and pull the s out of that, and it's the Schrodinger equation instead of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Mm -hmm. Now, if, yeah. if these become operators, uh, suddenly the Hamilton-Jacobi turns into the, the, the Schrodinger equation. You know, they are so close, a hair's breadth apart, and this method of Dirac's captures that. Right, okay, we build the Hamiltonian formulation. This little rule takes us from from that to the correct form for the commutators of our, our quantum theory. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, people stared at this for decades, right? You know, and, the, you know, they came up with rules that work. And, uh, you know, so, um, so you can well, I won't say who are we to question, because for physicists, we do question. You know, we keep looking at this. We keep trying different things, right? So, so if, I, if I'm following you right here, what I'm hearing is there's kind of two different methods that you can go about quantization for things. One of them is, mm -hmm. you know, you get the Hamiltonian classically, look at the Poisson brackets, quantize. Yeah, that's and right. then the other ones take the, um, 
the, the path integral or the action. Yes. And then right. you'll have the Lagrangian, but that one will be a little bit different. It's just a, a different way to get the same results, kind of with a different perspective on how to get there. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. All right. All right. So standard courses on quantum field theory pursue the canonical mm -hmm. quantization approach only? Oh no! You, you might you might find either of them taught as the mm -hmm. you know as the introduction to uh, quantum field theory. Um, I see. For example, if you look at uh, Ramon's book, he starts right in with the path integral approach. Mm -hmm. I see. Right on the edge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, you know, I heard that you know when they try to determine the renormalizability mm -hmm. of the weak force and some of the other forces. Yeah. They could only, like, this is Van de Hooft, one of these, this... A tuft. A tuft. <laughs> that they did it with a path integral approach. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's more, it really, it's more, it really sounds good. harder, but it's actually... No, actually, the, the path integral is, is really the method of choice, uh, you know, for, for research. You know, that's, that's pretty much what you do now. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, I, I like to start with the with the canonical approach because you know there's a certain familiarity to the Hamiltonian mechanics and uh, the Dirac rule is simple mm -hmm. and you you easily get to the uh, the free field theories that way. Um, now, with with the path integral approach, there there are some pretty sophisticated techniques for finding. Uh, you know, like multi-field correlation functions and things where you take derivatives of the path integral and pull down fields and, you know, there, there are a bunch of things you can do with that that you don't really try to handle this way. But this gets you a, a comfortable feeling about what you're doing and actually lets you explore, uh, you know, some of the things we will explore like, like the um, uh, antiparticles, you know, or uh, time reversal, the discrete symmetries, things like that. And they're totally equivalent, the two approaches. So far as anyone's shown, yeah, yeah, they're, you know, each, you know, it's it's sort of like the Heisenberg and Schrodinger pictures, which you know have been shown to be identical. Uh, I know of no differences between the path integral approach and the canonical quantization. Uh, you know, I don't know whether there is a proof <laughs> that they're equivalent. In fact, the. Uh, the, the path integral, uh, if, you, if you just look at quantum mechanics with a path integral, uh, there's a way to establish that it's convergent by uh, doing a, a, a rotation in the complex time plane. All right, it's, it's called a, what is this? Uh, Wick's rotation. A, a Wick, Wick yeah. rotation. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, a Wick rotation. Uh, it, it makes it into an ordinary Wiener path integral, which was known, you know, decades before Feynman did this complex path integral. Uh, the Feynman path integral is an inter integral over phases, but the uh, the the zeroth order to the Wiener path integral is the Fokker-Planck equation. It's, a, it's for a distribution, and that's known to converge for. Uh, for a wide class of potentials. All right, so if you wick rotate the Feynman path integral, you can show that the Feynman path integral converges for the same class of potentials. You can have potentials that <coughs> move so fast that, that it won't converge. But you know, you can prove some results like that. And I would I would say that in those cases, the the two are going to give you the same results. Now, <coughs> how you go about uh, doing perturbation theory uh, with canonical quantization is, is another matter. I mean, the real advantage of the path integral is that it gives you a systematic perturbation theory for uh, getting finer and finer approximations to interacting field theory. So unless you handle the interactions. Are there any, like, closed form solutions where you don't need to do perturbative techniques to get a solution? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no of no closed form solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. We just don't yeah. know. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. It sounded as if a few minutes ago that you were saying that the difference between 
the fundamental Poisson bracket and the commutation relations we have over there mm -hmm. is that the observables in the latter case um, do not commute where Correct. these commute. Yes. Yeah. The well, phi and pi over here commute. Uh, we're just defining this peanut butter bracket to be a difference of derivatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, it's anti-symmetric. Well, a commutator is anti-symmetric too. That property is preserved. But, yeah. no, uh, you know, phi hat, pi hat is something different than pi hat, phi hat. You know, this, this is not equal to zero if, if we let that act on some, some, some state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But isn't that the case in the middle? Well, yeah, for these functions. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, what is that? That's this, this is a Poisson bracket. This is the difference between two derivatives right. of these things. Right. right. <clears throat> so, uh, so, you know, these aren't acting on some state. Oh, I see. I see. Right. They're just, this is just some anti symmetrized set I of derivatives. See. Yeah. I see. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, sort of a. It's sort of a, a cross product of curls or something. Ah, I right? see. How is it that. Ah, we'll ask these things today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because it seems to me like we were able to get the. Uh, like Elie algebra from here. <coughs> yeah, sometimes these things form Elie algebra. Yeah. Um, uh, but so yeah. does quantum mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. It's remarkable when it does. Let's see. Okay, so in uh, yeah, in, in this chapter, there are conserved nether currents, right? The, this action has some symmetries. We have some conserved uh, energy momentum tensor, and from from those conservation laws, we can define some uh, conserved charges, and those charges are like energy and momentum. Right? We'll work through these. Right. So, so we will get energy and momentum uh, in a way that you know from the operators, right? We can we can actually build the operators that measure energy and momentum, and that makes sense. Okay, so patience, we'll get there. So uh, let me let me start over here and start writing a solution to all this. <clears throat> We're going back to the classical theory and solving solving the Klein Gordon equation. And then we'll see what it says when we make the operators into quantum operators. So we, we want to solve box phi equals minus m squared phi. Uh, let's first find a plane wave solution. We're going to let phi be some amplitude e to the i over h bar energy times time minus p dot x. Uh, so this is this is some function of position and time. <clears throat> so if we act with the Dalimbertian on that phi, well, we're going to we're going to pull down. Okay, two time derivatives will give us uh, I E over H bar squared. There's a one over C squared here if we want to keep track of that. And then the spatial derivatives are going to pull down uh, minus I P over H bar squared. And all of that times the original wave, P minus dot x. Now, this ends up being, let's see what happens. We get a minus and let's say a 1 over h bar squared c squared <coughs> and then e squared minus and we pulled out a c squared here so we're going to get p squared uh, p squared c squared. Is that right? Let's see. Uh, need a c squared in the numerator. I'm just wondering if we've got enough c's in the right places. Okay, so uh, 
the condition we're going to demand is that this be minus m squared c squared over h bar squared. And so uh, what we need is e squared minus p squared c squared. Of course, this is the usual energy relation. We multiply this across, we get, oh, there's, there's the other c, c to the fourth. Or the usual energy relation, e squared is p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice this does have both positive and negative energy solutions. Yeah. P c squared, c squared, c squared. Like this. Okay. Now, what we're going to do for now, until we get to a discussion of antiparticles, uh, we're, we're going to end up just looking at the positive energy solutions. Uh, I'm just going to put a step function in our Fourier transform to hold the energy positive. Then we'll go back and we'll <coughs> look at what happens with those negative energy solutions by looking at the, the green function with the source. So now we can write a Fourier series for this field uh, composed of these plane waves. Let me just check if I'm going to go straight to this. <sighs> Let's see. All right, what, what I've written here, I'm not sure if I have the right number of two pies here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write what I have in my notes, but uh, it seems to me that I want that. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it the other way. Uh, let's take two pi squared, because I'm doing a four-dimensional Fourier integral. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put a, a 2e here which is allowed because I'm going to put arbitrary mode amplitudes in anyway. It just turns out to be convenient to have that factor. So we have A, which is a function of the energy and momentum. Uh, it's, just, it's just this amplitude, but we can choose that amplitude differently for every energy and momentum. Then E to the I over H bar ET minus p dot x, and because phi is a complex, is a, is a real field, we're going to add the complex conjugate. And finally, uh, finally, am I doing it at this point? Yeah. Um, in order to uh, make this a solution to the equation, we need, we need this energy condition. So I'm going to stick in a delta function of uh, p alpha p alpha, that's p squared minus p squared uh, minus m squared. That imposes this energy condition that makes it satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. And finally, because we don't want to mess with the negative energies yet, I'm going to put a step function that only allows positive energy solutions. And then we integrate over all wave numbers, uh, h bar to the fourth e4p, like this. Uh, Okay. Anyway, that's that's what I've got here. Except for uh, in my notes, I have a three halves on that, it, but yeah. I'm not sure that's what we want. <coughs> that three halves. Yeah. That three halves is certainly there in the EMM case. Yeah, uh, on a three-dimensional Fourier transform, I definitely would have three halves. Oh. I, I want one over the square root of two pi for each dimension. I'm. Oh, I see. I'm doing. Um, that, that makes my Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform have the same coefficient. I see. Right, which is nice. So you only have to remember half as much. Okay, now, you guys know about delta functions? Uh, something like that. All right, a, a direct delta function of a function. 
Mm-hmm. Is, is this a familiar thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So if not, prove it. The sum over uh, roots x sub i of, uh, and then we need the um, 1 over f prime at absolute value of the derivative f, f evaluated at the roots times delta of x minus xi. Right? Clearly, each yeah. time f goes through 0, you're going to get a spike in your delta function. So it's got to be a sum over deltas at each root. And if you, if you work it carefully out, layout, expanding near the, the singularity, you, you find you need this normalization, including the absolute value. OK, so now we need <coughs> delta of e squared minus p squared, uh, which is at um, minus m squared. And that's going to be what? Uh, 1 over twice the absolute. So we take the derivative of e. We're thinking this is a delta of oh, yeah. e minus something. Well, we need 1 over the derivative is 2e, absolute value. And then uh, e minus p squared plus m squared uh, plus delta of p squared plus m squared. OK, so uh, we can replace this delta function, which is quadratic in energy, with this expansion. And then the restriction to positive energy is, is going to uh, make zero of that second solution, which we'll deal with later. OK, so now we do the energy integral. I have one quick question. Yeah. For for like solutions for, for just our normal coordinate equation here, how come we can't just do like separation of variables and just say sine and cosine, sine and cosine for the X, Y, Z, T? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Yeah. 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 You can, there are lots of approaches oh, to, to oh, solving okay. this. Okay. okay. You know, this, this is one that uh, works very neatly with quantization. Okay. Okay. Right. And so that, that's you know, easy. you know, okay. all quantum theory, you're going back and forth between mm -hmm. position and momentum spaces yeah. constantly. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, working in momentum space is a very convenient way to do these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I think we do want three halves here. But the thing is, we don't. You know, we've, we've put in one delta function, so uh, we're, we're not really going to get three Fourier transforms here. We're going to end up with or four. We're really going to end up with two. Uh, so let, let me just write some replacements here. Uh, these two together are going to give us one over 2e. And now I can now I can drop the absolute value because we declare e to be positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we're going to set e equal to the positive root p squared plus m squared. And then we can we can do uh, let's see for the volume element we can let uh, p equal h bar k and so. We're gonna we're gonna lose four factors of h bar. Those will go away, and we'll end up with an integral over wave number. We can equally regard the a's as functions of uh, omega and k as of e and p. So let's continue with the solution. Doing integral, we have two pi to the three halves. Uh, we're going to end up with integral uh, d3k over root 2, uh, now let's see. Divide by 2e. Yeah, 2e. So we're divided by 2e here, we have a 2e there. So we end up with a root 2e, um, which I want to write as omega, only I'm, I don't have the right number of Planck's constants here. I don't think. 
Uh, put in whatever constants you like there. What I want to end up with here is the, the frequency, 2 omega. Um, so to, to get that, um, you know, let's, let's put a fudge factor on the powers of <laughs> Planck's constant. I'll let you work out what that exactly is. But, okay, what we get is A of, of K only. Now, it's K only because E... Because of the delta function, we're doing the integral over this delta function. E has become a function of P, mm -hmm. or equivalently K. So uh, instead of A depending on both E and P, now it depends on P only, uh, which we're going to write in terms of the, the wave number K. Then we have E to the I K, uh, let's see, that's omega T minus K X. And then a conjugate of k e to the minus i omega t minus k dot x. And uh, close paren, we're integrating now over all wave numbers. So we've taken care of, uh, by using that delta function, we have ensured that uh, this satisfies the Klein Gordon equation. And this satisfies the Klein Gordon equation for any choice of this function A of K. Okay. So, any questions getting to this point? <coughs> so, for the E and M case, we got that as the vector potential. Yes, yes. And, okay, remember that pi is the time derivative of phi. So we can we can write that immediately too. D3k. What's going to happen is uh, time derivative pulls down an i, an i omega, and changes the sign. So we're going to get an overall i. We're going to have D3k. Uh, the extra omega makes this root omega over two, and then we still have a of k e to the i. Omega t minus k dot x. But now minus, because we pull down this minus sign yeah, differentiating, uh, a conjugate of k well, no, e to the no, minus no. i omega t minus k x. So there's our classical solution for the field and the momentum. What we're going to do next uh, oh, yeah, no. On Wednesday, who can make it Wednesday? I will be here. Yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, how did the fourth power go to three power? Is it because of the delta function? Oh. Uh, what well, this? I changed it. No. The oh. D four. You went from D four. D four p. All right. P is h bar k. Uh -huh. So this this is going to be h bar to the fourth times uh, d k. Uh, D D four, uh -huh. mm. but you know then we can do the omega integral, the k zero, right? Do we do the time like one? Mm -hmm. So use this delta function. We do the energy integral, mm -hmm. right? It leaves D three p or equivalently D three k. They're just proportional. Uh, yeah, I I should check the power of h we need okay. here to, 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 to turn everything into k's and omegas. But the, these are the final forms we want. This is this is phi of x and t. This is this is pi of x and t. Now, the next step, which we'll do next time on Wednesday, is we're going to invert these Fourier transforms to solve for a and a star, and we we can solve uniquely for those in terms of phi and pi. The crucial point. In doing that is that when we quantize phi and pi, these necessarily become operators. Mm -hmm. A will be a hat, a conjugate will become a dagger as an operator. And so we'll, we'll have uh, turned the mode amplitudes into operators. Do those mode amplitudes also depend on polarization? And not for the scalar field. For electromagnetic field, yes. Yeah, you, in, in the electromagnetic case, you've got a polarization vector in here as well. Right? You, I think you guys wrote yeah. that down yeah. last time. Yeah, right. And we'll be doing that 
you know, in the week or so. You know, we'll, we'll do, well, we're going to spend a long time on the Dirac equation because yeah. have you seen a solution to the Dirac equation? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we need to work through that in some he's, detail. He's hopeful. <laughs> Oh, it's not so bad, but uh, yeah, it's a little difficult. So uh, we'll spend some time on that. We're, we're, we're going to write all three of these free field solutions like this. Uh, we will find these the operator version of these, and their commutation relation is going to be a simple delta function, right? They're going to act just like raising and lowering operators. We will very shortly see that this gives us an infinity for the energy. And so, so you know then. We'll look at how to resolve that. And then we sweep it under the rug. <laughs> no, 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 no. You you come up with another rule. Yeah. Uh, right. 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 Another you know, Canonical quantization gives you a rule for going from Poisson brackets to operators. It does not tell you how to order operators in arbitrary dynamical variables, functions of phi and pi. We're allowed to add another rule for that, and adding just the right rule will resolve the infinity in the Hamiltonian. Right. So, you know, we're not doing anything that we're not allowed to do, and we're uh, absolving ourselves of a serious problem if we don't do it that way. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. One of my professors at my yeah. my old institution told me one of his uh, buddies would come in a little bit buzzed when he was studying the quantum mechanics. <laughs> Said he couldn't understand it any other way. Right. <laughs> use the sweeping infinity. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, it's just like he tried to say. You know, I had a similar thing before. Experience. What type? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As an undergrad, my quantum mechanics. <laughs> Professor, you know, brought in a six pack for all of us. Not strictly legal at the time, but we all appreciated it. Okay. All right.